now I'd like to move on to our, our, uh, our featured uh, talk today. Uh, professor Enrico Gratton is the, uh, he's a professor of both physics and biophysics here at the University of Illinois. Uh, he's the head of the laboratory for, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I pronounce this correctly, the laboratory for fluorescent spec, uh, dynamics, fluorescence dynamics, which specializes in fluorescent spectroscopy. And he's going to talk, talk to us a lot about medical imaging. Uh, it's a real honor to have Professor Gatton here to talk to us today. First of all, he gave the very first Saturday physics lecture. How many people were here for that lecture in 1993? <laughs> How many people were, okay, one person. Yeah, she's a ringer too. It's, uh, she's not fair. Uh, how many of you were four years old in 1993? <laughs> okay, anyway, so he gave the very first lecture uh, in 1993 to kick off this program, and, and 12 years later, we're still going strong. We really appreciate him coming back. And in fact, we also appreciate him taking time out of his very busy schedule because he's actually preparing, unfortunately for us, preparing to leave us to move to the University of California at Irvine. So he's very busy in transition, and so we appreciate him coming here. He's won numerous awards, both in terms of research and teaching. He's published a long list of papers that I can't even begin to, to uh, quantify, so I'm not going to try. Thank you very much, Professor Gratton, for coming to talk to us. Please help me welcome Professor Enrico Gratton. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming here this morning. So what I will talk today, actually, I try to look at if I have any residues of anything in my computer or in transparency of what I did, uh, whatever, now is more than 11 years ago, and I was unable to find anything. So I'm sure, uh, you know, everything is so new that I, I, I will not repeat uh, very many things. But I will repeat one thing that, for those of you who were here, I think there is one person, maybe you will recognize that. So what I want to show you today is, first of all, this is a physics uh, Saturday morning. So I want to talk a little bit about physics. Don't be afraid. Uh, it will be easy, it will be simple, and will be, I think, I hope, something that everybody, whatever age, uh, from two to whatever, well, maybe even earlier, um, can follow and can, I hope, understand what I want to show. Uh, that doesn't mean that if the things are simple, that things are not amazing. And uh, the title, I hope, uh, already uh, called your attention, which is uh, looking into the brain with laser. And uh, to give you an idea, well, this is a laser, okay, and we use as a laser pointer. And uh, what we want to do, after all, is to point the laser in the head, like exactly like I'm doing right now, and guess what? Try to understand how your brain works, and uh, how your thoughts are formed, and uh, what you're thinking. Why not? That can be dangerous, and there are many people who just refuse to submit uh, to this kind of experiments. They don't even want to know, you know, what that can reveal. Uh, nevertheless, we're going on with this research, and uh, I hope that at the end of the lecture, when you will leave the room, uh, you will get convinced that really pointing a laser on the head, literally speaking, you can get a lot of information. Uh, I never heard anything about that until about 15 years ago, when a friend of mine, a famous doctor, uh, called me and says, you know, Enrico, I have a big problem. I said, what is your problem, Dr. Chance? That's Dr. Chance is my friend. And they say, well, I'm shining a laser through my head. And uh, then he said, I'm shining the laser through the head of all my students. And uh, I send a pulse of light, you know, just a pulse of light, and says, in my head, the pulse just passed through at the speed of light. And uh, in my students, all my graduate students, it takes a lot of time to come out. <laughs> and they said, what's happened? Can you help me? And literally, this is not a joke. This is the way I started in the field. And you know, he was really a dear uh, friend. I said, well, you know, come here. Uh, come to the University of Illinois. I have a lot of machine. Maybe I can figure out. And of course, he was very much afraid that his head was completely empty. 
And things will pass through, and you can see that in the expression of uh, his eyes. No, by the way, you know, at that time, he was uh, 80 years old, now he's 95, still alive and still going, and uh, you will see the, his head was not empty at all. Uh, but he was curious, so he came in, and uh, so the day after, really, he was really so curious, say, how come, you know, you have to explain me that. And so he came in, and uh, so the day after, he arrived at Willard with the head, you know, come in, and uh, came to the lab and sat in a chair and say, shoot, no, put the laser. And uh, I said, well, uh, Dr. Chance, I need a little time. At least, you know, I have to be sure it will not go in your eyes. Uh, you know, also I have to put the detector in the other side. You know, I, how can we measure those things? So after an hour, we were doing measurement. And uh, wow, really the light was zapping in through his head. And uh, then I try on myself, and it was taking a much lot of time. And then I try on some of my young uh, students, and wow, you know, really the light takes a lot of time to come out. We were very curious about this stuff. And the poor man was very depressed, so we did an all today measurement. So at the, day, at the end of the day, uh, you know, he was really, you know, so it's true, you know, he was trying to say, so it's true that the light will go through my head, you know, there is nothing there. You know, poor man. <laughs> and uh, so I say, well, uh, Dr. Chance, let's go home. I will cook some spaghetti for you. You will be, that will raise your spirit. Let us sleep on and uh, let us see what happens. And so I invited him home. I cook a spaghetti. So he was very happy. A glass of wine did help. And so finally we went to sleep. Actually, he went to sleep and I look at the data. And literally, you know, this is not exaggeration. I look at the data. I did some sort of tricks on the data. I will show you what. And I say, oh, oh, I know what is happening. And uh, I, now I have to convince you that I was on the right track and I knew what it was happening. And I want to see if any one of you will be able to get the same sort of idea. Uh, and I, this is the reason why I did some demonstration. I cannot do the demonstration with a laser. Uh, that will require too many pieces to bring in. But I will do something which is very similar. And uh, everyone should be familiar with that. And uh, I hope you know, that you can follow this demonstration. And so I have here with me, I brought some milk, some sugar, some coffee, and uh, some cream. And I will do a very simple experiment with milk, sugar, coffee, and cream. And uh, you will see that uh, you know, maybe you can start to reason of what is happening when the light will go through the brain. And maybe, you know, there is such a young, many young people here. I'm sure some of you are very bright, actually all of you, for sure. And uh, maybe you can figure it out what will happen. So let me start uh, with uh, what I want to show. So the question is, can we see through the body using light? And that is something I will convince you at the instant, I hope. This is a laser. This is my finger. If I point it, do you see red? Okay, so clearly light will go through the, the body. Clearly, if I do that distance, you will not be able to see, but only because your eyes are not sensitive enough, but not because the light will not pass through. Okay, so this demonstration is very easy to do because the finger is, is small, whatever, has a relatively small distance, but you know, it's clearly you can see through. I want to show you another easy trick. You know, this is a red laser, and this is a, a green laser. And actually, this green laser is very powerful in comparison with uh, the red laser. And I will try to pass now the green laser through my finger. And uh, do you see anything? Nothing. OK, so you start to get some clues of what is happening, and uh, so some Wavelength, some colors will go through, some other colors will not go through. So let us see if we can start to build uh, our knowledge and uh, figuring out what is happening. And the question is, really, not so much can we see through the body, but what can we see? And uh, so I will show now some of the basic physics principles in how you can see through the body. And then let us see what, what is there. 
Okay, well, you know, clearly, I hope everybody has a brain there, at least you hope too, but uh, is that, the, can we say something about the brain? Can we say something about, uh, you know, how the brain works? And uh, might be, you know, how you think, or, you know, other things of that sort. Okay, so I will start with a movie. It's not an entire movie, otherwise it will take a lot of time. This is a movie in which uh, uh, Captain Kirk is trying to cure poor uh, Scotty, and he has uh, a head trauma, and is brought to the hospital there in Los Angeles. You know, as you know, Star Trek are coming from the 24th centuries, and they were visiting Los Angeles. I know why they were interested in that, but uh, they have to recover some whales. Uh, well, you know the story. And uh, they have an accident, and so poor Scotty is brought to the hospital. And then there is a dialogue. You will see the dialogue. I hope the sound will work. So you will follow all the words. And uh, then I will ask you something of uh, what is happening in that scene. And uh, is this really science fiction? Of course it is. But at the end of the lecture, I hope you will understand what this movie is, which is not so much science fiction. OK, let us see if it works. So let us click on Captain Kirk. And uh, I don't know. What the hell is that? What are you doing? Towering of the metal meningeal artery. What's your degree in? Dentistry? How do you explain slow impulse, low respiratory rate, and coma? Fundoscopic examination. Fundoscopic examination is unrevealing in these cases. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. My God, man. Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. I'm going to have you removed. Doctor, doctor, such unprofessional behavior. Into that little room, please. What is that? You fucking gun? Nurses? You must be crazy. Please, please. 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 leave this. Who is this guy? I have no idea. He up with the lock. Dealing with medievalism here. Chemotherapy. Fundoscopic examinations. Come on, check up. Wake up. Bob, can you hear me? He's coming around, Jim. Bob, talk to me. Name, rank. Chekhov. Pavel. Rank. Admiral. Tracy, tell us Dr. Clark is all the operator. How's the patient, Doctor? He's gonna make it. He, he, he came in with a sheet. One little mistake. Okay. Okay, so, do you have any idea what happens there? What was that device? Okay, I will tell you that that device was a device which contained some lasers. It was applied to the head. The guy did a, a diagnosis of uh, what was happening in the head. Then, automatically, the system, whatever, turned on and cured the guy, and the guy is walking away. Uh, is that science fiction? <laughs> yeah, clearly, it is. I say, but it's not so far. Okay, you will see. Okay, let's go on. So, I told you that light is passing through the finger, for example, and the demonstration is very easy. No, you can see red in the other side. Now, for those of you who pay a little of attention, you see that the laser focus really a very narrow beam, but if you look here, the light comes out from a very wide region. It's not really a point, you see. I don't see just a point illuminated but it's very spread everywhere. And this is spread because there are some physics principle that says that the light, as go through a medium, will uh, be subject to two kinds of processes. One is scattering, and the other is absorption. If you never heard about those words, let us see what really is happening. Okay, what is scattering? Scattering means that the light 
is refracted by a particle. So suppose that this is the light that is coming in. Suppose we have a cell, a particle, something, you know, your finger is filled up with different material, and the light will deviate from the path and uh, will deviate by an amount which depends on many things, the size of the particle, depends on the shape of the particle, but also depends on the difference between the index of refraction of the particle with respect to the medium. If there will be no difference in the index of refraction, there will be no difference in the velocity of light as it passes through the object, and the light will not be deviated, will just go through, and you will not see the object. Even if the object is there, you can see only because it has a different index of refraction and because the light will get scattered. So let us start with this concept. Here you have as, uh, uh, some indication of the index of refraction of air, which is one, which means that the speed of light in the medium with respect to vacuum is about, or vacuum in respect to medium, is about one. The speed of light in water, so the speed of light in vacuum divided the one into water is about 1.33, and if you have oil, it's about 1.44, and you will see that you will need those numbers to interpret later on what I will do. One important thing is that if you have many particles, like you have in the finger, then what you have is uh, multiple scattering. So instead of scattering only once, the light can be scattered twice, or can be scattered three times, or can be scattered many, 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 many times. And in fact, this is what is happening. And every time the light is scattered, it takes a slightly different direction. Therefore, if you look in the screen, in the other side, instead of having a very narrow angle of illumination, when I point with my laser through the finger, you have a very broad range of illumination. And that is telling us that what we see is multiple scattering. For those of you who pay a little bit of attention to what I'm saying, there is another thing that you can see from this figure, and that will help you in understanding what my friend Chance had. Uh, still, you need some clues in order to get to the solution. But clearly, you can see that the path here that is taking the light, you see, all this path is longer than the direct path. So that there is also a delay, a change in time as the light goes through. And the more scattering you, you get, so the light zigzag until it will get out. So my response to Dr. Chance the day after is, well, it's simple. After all, your brain scatters much less than the brain of a young person. And then he say, how come? And then I say, well, Dr. Chance, because you have much more gray matter. And he was so happy about this explanation. <laughs> OK. And actually, my explanation is correct. And uh, I will show you now with some examples how that happened. OK. So let's go on. And I want to try a demonstration Oh, I don't know if I can see her here anything, but uh, has this appeared? Oh, just to know. Okay. So let us see if I can do the demonstration. Um, so let us assume this is like white matter, like you have in your brain. Of course, it's not. This is milk. I, I use my home milk. I put in this bottle this morning. Okay. And I will. Uh, put some milk on a well on the um, projector, and you see I just put a slide that you can see letters, you can see something. And uh, as I put some milk in, you know, I say that, that uh, you essentially lose the visibility to the object, and this is because milk is white and is scattering, and you cannot see through. You see, if I put my finger, you cannot see through. And you cannot see through because the light scatters and will not go straight. 
And uh, you can see that after I added the milk, you can see very little. Okay. Now, I have here a bottle which contains sugar. I diluted sugar in water because otherwise it would take some time to dilute. I have here a cup of coffee that I just filled up, up there. And I have here a, some cream. And the question to you is, if I want to see through that object, what I will add in that well? Will I add the sugar? Will I add the coffee? Will I add the cream? Or no matter what I do, I will never be able to see through. Okay, let us take an answer. Why I should add the coffee? Is that, that can be the correct answer. Simply I'm asking you to to give an explanation. Okay. Uh, I would say your explanation is pretty, pretty good. Eh? And in fact, uh, coffee means that the a material becomes a little bit more absorbing. By being more absorbing, it will, the multiple scattering will be reduced and then you can see through a little bit better. Unfortunately, I cannot do this experiment here because by adding the coffee, I will make things too dark and they will, will not see through because our eyes is not sensitive. But your answer will have been correct, except for this little problem on the light intensity. If I have a good detector, your answer will have been correct. Very good. Congratulations. Okay, so that is very good but doesn't work. So now, what we do? But the sugar, why? Uh, okay, I will put a little bit of sugar, we not diluted milk enough. Well, if I add water, yes, I dilute it eventually. I wash it out the milk, but that, that's not allowed in the brain. You cannot dilute the brain. <laughs> Yeah, it will do it, I, I agree with you, but it has to be a little more sophisticated, it's something you can do on the brain. Do, do we have any other, well, there are not so many options. <laughs> so, yes, we add the sugar, but the explanation is different. Okay, I will add the sugar to show you that really it works, but it, it works not because of the dilution, because I will add only a few drops. And let us see if you can try to find out why it works. Well, it's a little dense, and it takes some time to get out. It looks like a molasses. Okay, so now you can see through. Okay, do you know what is happening? It's not because of the dilution. Any idea? Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> it's much simple, it's physics. You know, I, I like your answer, but it looks like chemistry. This is a lecture about physics. Let's go to the physics principle. <laughs> so I said it's a physics answer. I am giving you a clue. Well, let's go back to one slide. I say the, that particle scatter the light depending on the difference of the index of refraction between the medium and the particle. By adding sugar, I match the sugar has a very high index of refraction. So I start to match the index of refraction, and what's happened is that uh, what I get is much less scattering. In fact, you can see through very well. So if you add sugar, essentially, you can see through very well. That's a very interesting observation. And in fact, it resulted in a patent that our lab submitted how to measure sugar in the blood, for example. Just this simple observation. And this physics is not related to aggregation, to enzymes uh, or whatever that are trying to chew the milk. So it's really a physical principle. Okay, let's go on. The other process that we have, I said, is uh, absorption. 
and the light gets absorbed in the brain and get absorbed because we have molecules that absorb the light. Yeah. And what are tho those molecules? Well, if we look in detail, what happens is the following. We have in all our tissues, muscle, brain, a real very large uh, uh, net of capillaries. Every cell in our body has to be to a distance of about no more than 100, 150 microns from a source of oxygen. And the oxygen comes from the blood. It's the hemoglobin in the blood, which is in the red blood cell, which carries the oxygen. And if we don't have the oxygen, the cells cannot proliferate and cannot live. So what happens is that inside one of those little capillaries, I will show you a different picture later on, we have a red blood cell, which are shown here. Generally, those are two, three microns, very, very microscopic. This is the red colors that you see. Those red blood cells contains billions and billions and billions of a protein, which is called hemoglobin, which actually has one, two, three, four sides where oxygen will bind. And I will not go through this story, but hemoglobin, as I hope everybody knows, is red, that's blood, is red, and uh, uh, is the major absorber in that particular region of the spectrum. This is why you see red, okay? And you see red because of the hemoglobin, because of the blood, okay? And the uh, hemoglobin is so much absorbing in the green, so much, that that's the reason why I cannot send the green laser to my finger because it's so much absorbing. But in the red, I can still see something. And to give you an idea of the scale that we are talking, we have the arteries, which are bringing in the oxygen. We have this capillary bed, which is enormous. In length, it's, it's really enormous. And every single cell that will be here will be fed in terms of oxygen by the capillary bed. Eventually, there is a, an exchange of the oxygen with uh, CO, CO2, which is what has been used in the cell, in the metabolism, and then the blood, which will have a different amount of oxygen, will go into the veins, and then eventually will go into the lungs, get reoxygenated again, and that is physiology. However, we need to understand this principle, which is basic. Everyone, I hope, knows about this principle, that you need to breathe and you need the oxygen in order to understand what is coming next. Okay, what is coming next is the following. That blood in a spectral region, which is here, in the, we call in the near infrared, has relatively low absorption. While if we go toward the green, that will be here, the absorption is very high. And this is, I say, why green will not go through. And in this region, something extraordinary happened. We're lucky. And what happens is that when the blood is oxygenated, to respect of when the blood is deoxygenated, so it doesn't have the oxygen, the spectrum changes very dramatically. And maybe you have observed that too, because you know that the arterial blood, which is oxygenated, is red, while the uh, deoxygenated blood has a different color, it's brownish. And actually, you can see by eye, you don't need really to be a spectroscopist and, uh, you know, you can just see by eye. And it's an observation that I think, I think the ancient people have done and have a different color. So, wow, that is really interesting that just by the color, we can distinguish if the blood gets oxygenated or not. So now let us try to build our reasoning and now let us try to exploit that. So let's go to the basic, I will call basic physiology during the brain activity. I don't know if you ever heard about that, but the brain, when works, uses energy. Probably you heard about that. And uh, actually uses energy a lot. And if you are using your brain, you get, really, you need a lot of food, <laughs> okay? Because really it uses a lot of brain, a lot of uh, energy. So when, in particular, when we use one part of the brain, for example, one part respect to other, then in that region of the brain, 
we use energy in order for the cells to survive and to continue in the operation this energy must be replenished and must be replenished fast if you don't do it fast if your brain gets without oxygen for a couple of minutes it's dead it dies so we need have a mechanism which is intrinsic is built in in every uh, uh, every animal every subject every man woman whatever that has a brain in which there is a mechanism by which as you use it there is a fast replenishing and uh, what's happened is not only that to replenish the oxygen but co2 is produced in the metabolism and co2 needs to be washed out very rapidly okay so we need two things to replenish with oxygen and to wash out the co2 how the physiology works well the physiology way as soon as you have a production of co2 apparently the co2 the extra co2 changes what we call the acidity the ph of the blood the blood becomes more acidic as a response to that the uh, blood vessels open up dilate becomes wider as they become wider a lot of more blood is flushed in that blood is an arterial blood and this arterial blood carries more oxygen in and carries out the co2 and this is really the basic mechanism by which the uh, we can continue having brain activity and in every place where we have brain activity we can have this process there is a dilation and then a washout and more oxygen comes in so now if you pay some attention say wow wow now suppose that really i can illuminate my brain with a laser and suppose i can distinguish between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin well what I, what I will see that if i use that part of the brain i have to see that the oxygenation of the blood the oxygen part of the hemoglobin will increase and the deoxygenated blood will decrease that is really what i expect to see so the question is suppose we can see through what we expect to see well we expect to see something that changes the spectrum let us see if that works okay so what happens is shown here and uh, so as the activated state which means as the cell the neurons act there is an exchange of oxy with the oxy hemoglobin this is an image which is obtained by a technique which is called functional mri so is mri that is connected to a function and uh, what is plotted here is the quantity of the deoxygenated blood with respect to the base value in particular part of the brain and in particular this part corresponds to the motor cortex this experiment we ask the subject to move the hands and as it moves the hand just grabs the brain get oxygenated in that point so it really works and uh, you can see this effect or you can do for example different kind of thing you can ask uh, a subject just to do a finger operation and actually every finger maps in a different parts and you can tell essentially what is doing and this is you know the motor cortex but every other part of the brain works exactly in the same way every time you use a part of the brain it requires more oxygen then what changes is the level of oxygenation and the, the word that we use in science to describe this effect is called the bold effect which stay bold it's not bold okay it stay for blood oxygen level dependent effect and uh, it's a really bad name but that's the way it's known and this call it the bold effect okay so let's go on and see what happens so that for example is for auditory uh, stimulation and you see this part of the brain is the part that gets activated this is for visual stimulation and of course there are many parts that get stimulated but mainly the visual cortex which is in the back of the brain and i will say today we know how this system works very well so let's go on and see now how we that was using mri so using magnetic resonance let us see how we can do the same thing with the laser well 
actually, we use a slightly different principle, exactly what I said, but you have to make one more logical step. And the logical step is the following. Remember what I said, as the light goes through, it gets scattered, gets scatters, and as it gets scatters, it gets back, reflected back. And uh, without going in any detail about the theory, you need some physics theory here, what's happened is that if you illuminate one point of the brain and you detect the light at a given distance, actually the only way a ray of light which is injected here and is detected there will be detected if it passes through a very restricted region of space. You have like, like, a, like a, a beam of light that will illuminate a given part of the brain. That's really fantastic. And so you can, just by shining the light like that and measuring at a given distance, you can have like a beam of light passing through your brain, passing over the cortex of your brain, and now maybe if you do a spectral analysis, you will be able to tell if that part of the brain gets activated or not. And this is actually how it works. And you can apply those fiber optics, it's, it's a system that we have in our lab and many other people now have in the world, in which you analyze the signal of the light which is passing through the brain. So we go back to our title, can we see into the brain? And now let us see what we see, okay? Because clearly we are at a level now that we understand enough of the light, the way the light will go into the brain to understand that actually it will be transmitted, it will be even reflected on the same side, which is never will happen, you know, in, in air. The light will just go in one direction. We, well, part will also be reflected, but that's a different story, okay? And, uh, but in, in, in the very highly scattering medium, the multiple scattering, it goes in circle. And this is really the principle that we are using. Okay, now what we see? Well, clearly I will not tell you this story if you will not see signals. And let us understand what this plot means. I understand that plots are really difficult to see, but if I can go through what is happening, so this is the time in seconds in which a subject is uh, uh, asked to perform a task. And this task is moving the hand like that. So the subject, you know, can be one of you, is uh, staying there, we illuminate the brain, like in the Dr. Chan's experiment. And then what we do is to say, let us measure different parts of the spectrum. I will not go in any detail of that. And let us see what happens about the hemoglobin. And what you can see in this graph is that the deoxyhemoglobin is in this color blue and the oxyhemoglobin is in the color red. And uh, as the task start, it starts here and stops there, you see that the more oxyhemoglobin, so more oxygenated blood comes in, eventually reach a maximum, stops the task and goes away. And the deoxyhemoglobin is washed away so half that level go, goes away and so on. And different subjects more or less show the same thing. Actually, our brains are different depending on the person, depending on, on what you do. And actually, even from day to day, you will not obtain always the same kind of response. But that's, again, another point. Okay, so clearly we can do that. Now we can try to do maps and see which part of the brain get activated. And I will not go very much in detail about that, but this is an experiment which is done with MRI for the uh, um, brain activation in the motor cortex. And this is the equivalent thing that you can see if you just shine lasers. And this is exactly the same signal, exactly in the same place. So with lasers, you can see the brain activation in a particular location of the brain. So that's great. And uh, that shows other kind of experiment, for example, done in the motor cortex and uh, here is visual simulation. So the subject just see a flashing screen and then it stops and then flash and then stops. And every time it flash and then stop, you can see that there is an increase in the blood flow and a decrease in the deoxyhemoglobin. And depending on the location where you are, in some location the signal is very large because that's the part that you activated. And in some other location the signal is very small because there is no brain activity in that part. So, I'm trying now to, I hope I convince you that you can really see inside your brain with laser, not only, but you can tell if that part of the brain is working or not. And that, of course, is very interesting. Uh, in principle, 
you know, you can do a lot of uh, studies. Light is uh, something relatively simple in the sense that it uh, costs very little. Uh, those, it's not dangerous to you. It's really light like those lasers. So literally, what we use are those kind of lasers. So this is the kind of things that we have. So let me go rapidly to a movie that we did. So this is done in my lab. And that shows, moving the hand, how the uh, different parts of the brain get activated. And this is a movie which is done in real time. And this movie was done by one person working in my lab, Mariangela Franceschini, has been shown in different uh, shows, uh, on TV, whatever, uh, because it was really the first time that uh, somebody just using lasers was able to see the activation of the brain. And uh, you can see the effect for those of you who know a little bit about brain organization. Then when you do the right hand, the left part of the brain gets activated. If you move the left hand, the right part of the brain gets get activated. So everything works like it's supposed to work. And you can do those things real time, really. You can have a helmet, as uh, maybe I will show you later on. I have one picture for the baby having a helmet. And, uh, and then you can tell which part of the a brain gets activated or not. Okay, so applications. I have two slides of application. I will not go very much in detail, but uh, uh, those are perhaps the most interesting application of this technology. Uh, and those are, as you can understand, already in the clinics, and there are many clinics in the world using this principle. Uh, this application uh, relates to neonatal care. This is a baby and she has a helmet which is made of all fiber optics and the purpose is to measure the oxygen. What happens is that whatever percentage of babies uh, are born premature. For those babies born premature, the lungs are not well developed. If they are not well developed, they will not exchange the oxygen. If the brain doesn't get the oxygen, they get the brain damage and uh, they will get that brain damage for the rest of their life forever. Okay, so it's very important that we know what is happening, and eventually there are some, some few things that can be done. And one thing that can be done is to administer oxygen through a mask. However, if you administer too much oxygen, you can uh, have a very opposite effect. The baby will become uh, blind, which is of course something that you don't want to have, and uh, eventually you can damage much more by adding so much oxygen. So it has to be the right quantity. And believe it or not, the only way the doctors have today to look if the baby or had before this optical method, if the baby had enough oxygen or not, was just to look at the color, say, well, it's blue, let us put some more oxygen. It's red, okay, so that's fine. And was based on the color. And uh, so, you know, clearly it's a very, I would say, primitive way to do. So I remember, doctor, I remember the movie, you know, it really looks like medieval kind of, si of science, but this is what you have. And this is what instead the optical technology can provide. You know, get out of the medieval and uh, let us try to have a quantitative way to see what is happening in the brain, for example, in the case of baby. So this is one application. Another application which is very interesting and is having, I would say, you know, this is something very recent and is having a lot of uh, resonance now in the literature and uh, in uh, interest among the clinician, among uh, also common people, is uh, about brain reservoir activity. Remember what I said. In order for you to think the uh, uh, blood vessel in the brain must dilate because they must bring more oxygen. Well, you can guess that as you become old, that capability disappears. And uh, clearly, everybody knows that the old people, as an average, there are of course exceptions, performs much less psycho in psychological tests than a young person. And the question is, is vasoreactivity related to that? Is it a consequence or is it a cause? And can vasoreactivity be reestablished if you lose it? Is there any diet, any exercise, any drug 
that you can get in order to recover it. Oh, wow, it would be interesting. Okay, so might be we can keep the brain healthier. And there are not so many things that you do for your brain. You do for your heart, you do for your muscle, and uh, very few people think about the brain. But the brain, I'm sorry to say, is the most important part of you. Okay, and the health of the brain and the tests that we do are really medieval, are of something that people were doing really thousand years ago. And uh, we have very little, uh, very few methods to see that. So there are, I say, age-dependent effect. There are uh, clinical reasons for loss of uh, vasoreactivity. And generally, those clinical reasons bring to stroke and so on. And are, is related to diet. We know that. Is related to exercise. OK, so if you exercise the circulation, it helps. But if you do exercise for the brain, it will help even more. OK, so here, here there is like a new science that you can have and you can develop by measuring with the optical methods what is happening in the activity. Uh, and then, of course, how brain radioactivity affect the brain function, we know a lot. And uh, so this is important. How can we measure and what we can do? And this is one of the issues that are interesting and are coming out. And to give you an idea how we do this measurement, we are not the only one in the world. Now this field, since the first experiment I, sh I told you about Dr. Chance, after 15 years, there are certainly more than 10,000 people in the world doing this kind of experiment, has expanded so much, I cannot keep track of what is happening. No way. Uh, I say the instruments are in the clinics. It's, it's really something has expanded everywhere, and you will see more and more of that. Uh, this is the probe that we use in this city, in the Carl Hospital, to do measurements on reactivity in people who suffer from sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a disorder which affects uh, people at all ages, and it's a disorder in which people stop breathing during sleep. And uh, generally, everybody has a little bit, even the young people, you stop breathing, but when you stop breathing too much, the, ox the brain gets deoxygenated because the consumption continues, and eventually some cells will die. If th that happens, the person generally gets uh, a decrease the performance, psychological performance, is tired and uh, cannot really do well at job. And uh, not only that, but fall asleep when he's driving and generally is very, very dangerous and conduce to death, you know, if it's not cured and it's not taken into account. So what we have done here in the city was to try to figure out about the brain reserve activity of those people. And uh, what we discovered, that was, I think, you know, we were the very first one to measure something like that. So this is the instrument that we have been using, which is actually is built here in Champagne. So this is a spin-off of the activity of the university, very interesting one. What happens is shown here. And bear me with this slide, I understand that it's complicated, but I will try to show you what it means. So what we have here, you see, is a signal that oscillates. And this signal is obtained by passing a breathing valve, so something that simply gives you a voltage as you move, as you breathe. And clearly, you can see that at some point, we ask the person to say, hold the breath. So don't breathe, breathe for about 10, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Everybody can do that. And then you see, hold the breath. As you hold the breath, what happens is that the uh, oxygenation in the brain will tend to decrease because there is consumption. And then you have a dilation of the blood vessel, and this dilation makes a tremendous flux of oxygen in. And that's the normal reaction. And it's well known that the brain will be the last one to be deoxygenated if you don't breathe. So all the oxygen from the body will go there. And you can see that very well. There is no way you can mistake that. And that also washes out the, the oxyhemoglobin and you can see this characteristic event. However, just pay attention what happens of uh, a person who suffers from sleep apnea. Okay, so you see here that the oxygenation increases due to this vasoreactivity. Well, here, bong, goes down. So not only this poor person, subject, suffers from sleep apnea and doesn't breathe, but the brain gets really deoxygenated. If you 
will do, if you are, I said, a normal subject and you just hold your breath, actually you do something w good to you because you will have this vasoreactivity. But those people have completely lost their vasoreactivity. And uh, in fact, it's very dangerous because, you know, what happens is that essentially the, the brain cells will die, so many per day, and eventually the person will suffer irreversible damage. So this is, I said, a research that was done here at the University of Illinois. It's, I think it's the first time that something like that was observed. Now it's in the literature. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's one very interesting result of how just by shining a few lasers on your head, doing the proper measurement, you can really tell a lot about the working of the brain and the physiology of the brain. So I will try to summarize this lecture and to see what are the salient points, both from the point of view of the physics, what you have learned, a little bit of physics, and then from the point of view of the applications and where you know, the results of doing some physics, starting from trying to explain how the light goes through the brain of one of your friends, okay, you end up by developing a method which is now, I said, available to really many, many people and I hope something good. So, first of all, in this lecture we have seen about the physics of light propagation in tissue, in particular this process of scattering and absorption. And I hope you will remember that and you will remember now when you look at the milk, a cup of milk, and you add some sugar, pay attention, and you will see they will become much more transparent. And if you have not that, probably many of you, you know, in the morning you have cereal, you put the sugar, and then you put, well, cereal, and then the milk becomes more transparent. That's the explanation, because you have sugar, and the sugar matches the index of refraction, and then you can see much better too, and uh, you have seen this demonstration. Pay attention, you know, a good scientist pay attention to every detail, even when you are eating about what happens in your bowl of cereal. So we have seen the basic physiological response to different stimuli, which is as the brain uses oxygen, the uh, blood vessels dilate to bring more blood to wash out the CO2 which has been formed and to replenish the oxygen. And that is a basic mechanism. Without that, apparently, you have sustained activity. It's a very important, interesting point. So, uh, what you have learned also from the physics point of view, that we can measure the oxygen because we have like a, a natural indicator. We don't have to inject anything. We don't have to do anything. This center is the hemoglobin itself that fortunately has very different color, very, very different spectrum, depending on the state of oxygenation. And this is a gift and uh, really is very important. So, this is from the physics point of view. From the point of view of the clinical importance and clinical relevance, I say during the past 10 years, we have made enormous progress in understanding how to use light inside the human body. And uh, that science fiction uh, clip of the movie is actually not so much science fiction. At the moment you understand, I didn't talk about therapy done by light, because you can also do a lot of therapy by light, but I, I didn't talk about that. Importantly, light is safe. You can, you have subject, you know, is, is the quantity of light that you inject uh, with a laser, this laser is much, 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 much less than the one that you receive from the sun. And everybody agrees that being in the sun is not really particularly dangerous, other than for skin cancer because of the UV. Okay, so even in the room that we are now, we are receiving much more light, and uh, maybe you never thought that your brain is illuminated. And actually, you do have light receptors in your brain, which are very important for your life cycle, for your circadian rhythm, and so on. Okay. Uh, so light provides signals about what is happening in the physiology of tissue. So if the tissue is healthy or not, if it's using oxygen or not. And I said many optical devices have now been produced, and they are used in the research and clinic. You have seen a few of them, but there are many, many more. And uh, I want to say that clearly UIUC, this university, has been at the frontier of this field and we're very proud about that. And uh, I want to acknowledge the university, the Laboratory for Fluorescence Dynamics, which is my lab, which is sponsored by NIH, which is providing funds for this research. And my present research group, I have, have really many people working in this area. But just to give you an idea, 
of the different kind of application that even at the level of research as done here in the Department of Physics, that can be important for those of you at high school who wants to come here. Uh, this is the present list of the people I have, and uh, Enrico D'Amico is working in the neonatal care field and neurosurgery. Raj is uh, working in sleep apnea together with Antonio Mikalos, who actually is the person who did this initial observation, and he's now well known because of uh, those observations about what happens in vascular reactivity in the case of sleep apnea. Shweta is uh, working together with Paul Simonson in uh, using light in order to detect breast cancer. This is also a very important pro uh, problem. And uh, you know that you can do mammography, which is X-ray, which is uh, inject uh, essentially X-ray in your body, which is not so safe. And if that can be substituted by light, will really be a tremendous progress in the field. Uh, uh, Natalia, Nati, has been wor working with some people here at the speech and hearing about swallowing disorder, apparently Swallowing is a process which requires coordination of the uh, brain and muscle in a very determined sequence. And there are many clinical cases in which you lose this capability. You cannot swallow. Okay. And uh, to do the therapy and understanding if the therapy is correct or not, of course, is a very important thing. Chiara, together with Bill, is working on IDH. This is also a very interesting thing. Uh, it's a very common disease about effects on the order of five to 10% of the kids in the school age. And apparently, one of the hypotheses is that ADH is caused by circulation, by poor circulation in one part of the brain. And that part of the brain cannot develop properly. And then the activities that in a normal brain are differentiated between left and right part cannot develop in those kids. And that produces uh, this uh, phenomenon of hyperactivity and, uh, atten uh, and disorder in learning and so on. And uh, Molly is a new student and she's trying to build a new machine, new device to measure blood flow directly. And uh, I really thank you very much for your attention and I hope that now you see that uh, Star Trek is not so science fiction after all. Thank you. Have questions. That's a very good question. Um, I was just reading the past month several application intra uterus. And in fact, it's how that the light will be safer than ultrasound. And first of all, ultrasound doesn't give you information about, uh, um, um, I say, the physiology of the tissue. So the problem that those people were trying to look with was to, you know, you know that in the, uter in the uterus, the uh, babies can hear sounds. And then in, in principle, you can tell if the sounds, uh, if they can, can, you can see directly if they can, uh, hear the sound. And so th those were measurements were done exactly with this purpose because they have a family, whatever history, in which they have defects in the cochlear. Uh, uh, and so they were trying to use intrauterine uh, uh, methods exactly based on this principle to look at the brain activity. Much more will follow. And it's considered to be very safe. For the hypoxia, you say, of course, of course. That, that's also a very important thing. And for monitor of hypoxia, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any? Like, when you, when you talk about the milk example, like, I understand that you care about, like, the inner contraction of clothes or something, and then it's more transparent, but how does sugar make the inner contraction really matter? Because the water is 1.33. Pay attention to my number. Okay. Uh, milk. So the particle of milk is 1.42. So if you can bring the water, which is 1.33, to 1.42, the milk will be totally transparent. You will not see. So what we do is that the sugar, per se, has a relatively high index of refraction. Depending on how much I put in, I will match a little bit. So I get it closer and closer. If I will do much more than that, 
eventually, at some limit, the milk will become transparent. So, so it scatters less. Together, Excuse me? Milk, well, I have milk. This is, well, this is milk. This is whatever, something I prepared this morning, which I pour several spoons of sugar in hot water because otherwise it will not dissolve. And this is sugar essentially. So when I add, you can measure the index of a fraction of that stuff. And I will say by I, approximately 1.38, I guess. I have my eye calibrated. Okay, so clearly it gets closer, 1.33, probably it gets 1.35, and that's enough to see that effect. Yes. But, but we, of course, we can measure those things, and th this is just a demonstration. Yeah. No, they have more absorption. No, no, the, the, the question about Dr. Chance is about absorption. And uh, it's not about sugar, which you said is a, can be a problem with diabetic people and so on. Uh, it's a problem of absorption. And what happens is that the brain of a very young person is white. The brain of an adult is gray. Okay, you, you, that, that's well known. And the gray is because it absorbs light. And then you don't have multiple scattering. The moment you don't have multiple scattering, all the long paths don't exist. So this is why the laser was going through directly. And this is why it gives the appearance that it was empty. But it's only because all the light was channeled in a very narrow region. So that is the explanation for Dr. Chance. Any more questions? Yeah. The quantity, but this is known from different kinds of measurement. Yes, it, it is very similar, and uh, yeah. But, but one is used in the brain, but the mechanisms are different. The, the metabolism is different. The brain uses sugar, essentially, and uh, you know, it's, it's a different sort of energy. But at the end, in terms of oxygenation, it's about the same. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, they correspond more or less. I, I have a question. Yeah, please. So Well, uh, I'm not saying that quite way. It's very interesting because there are several uh, uh, kind of uh, things like yoga, like uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, you know, the masters, whatever, that they do a rhythmic breathing all their life. So they, they learn how to do rhythmic breathing, which is different than the natural one. We, for reasons I will not go through uh, now, we, ha we did measure those people, and they appear to be really younger. So they in the, we have like a standard curve that says, you know, as a function of age, this is your decline, the average decline. Well, those people look 30 years younger. So why not? Wow. <laughs> why not? Well, if, if any of you have any further questions, I'm sure Professor Gatton would, would be happy to chat with you for a few minutes afterwards. You're welcome to come down front. Uh, we hope to see you all again in two weeks to hear about the first 10 seconds of the universe. Thanks for coming, everybody, and uh, have a good rest of the day.